Hi, HR Nation. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives and the world's leading global brands. Today, we have a, a special guest on the show, someone I'm super excited to introduce you all to. We're joined by Ernesto Ciroli. Ernesto is a TED speaker and noted authority in the field of sustainable economic development and is the founder of the Ciroli Institute. Welcome to the show, Ernesto. How are you? Hi, Chris. Uh, I'm calling from California. It's election day. <laughs> so you can no, imagine. Say no, say no more. <laughs> so you can imagine. So, um, uh, and uh, really, um, it is very, very impressive that you have reached out to me because uh, if there is someone who does not really understand HR, I'm here because I have questions <laughs> and, uh, uh, and even though I have some uh, good friends in, uh, in uh, very high HR positions, I don't really uh, understand your world and your industry. But when I spoke to you first, I expressed uh, some thoughts about things that are puzzling right now. Um, you know, why it is so hard to motivate millennials? Uh, you know, how, uh, you know, how come uh, HR departments are becoming uh, commodities? How come there are corporations that are actually pushing HR uh, out of the core business, uh, you know, to companies that specialize in, uh, in HR instead of treasuring the possibility of understanding better their own people? Uh, so, um, in, uh, you encouraged me to tell you a little bit about my, my story and, uh, uh, and I would like to introduce my question to HR specialists by describing what I do. Uh, I am, um, my, my life, my, my career, I study uh, development and uh, develop them both from a social and economic standpoint. And uh, uh, my dissertation with uh, at Rome University was the Italian personnel for technical cooperation with African countries. I was a, uh, an employee of one of the very first Italian uh, NGOs working in Africa. I worked in many African countries for six, seven years. And uh, I then, uh, pretty disappointed uh, with what we were doing in, in Africa with uh, uh, our own approach to development, I discovered the work that a very well-known British economist, Ernest Schumacher, was doing in uh, Africa. And Ernest Schumacher uh, was the author of a book that became a bestseller in the 70s. Uh, when I was in Africa, the title of the book is, of course, Small is Beautiful. <laughs> a small is Beautiful was like a complete new look at how uh, the possibility of working in development differently. What uh, Ernest Schumacher was advocating was to do development, not parachuting our own ideas onto indigenous people arriving uninvited like missionaries <laughs> to say, here, yeah, this is the solution. Yes. By the way, and a lot of companies do that when they move into new countries. So if they're opening up an office oh. in Asia or they do, companies do the exact same thing. Um, Bang, well, you're right, you colonize. <laughs> so uh, Schumacher had this, uh, uh, this amazing intuition and in Small is Beautiful, he says, um, above all, if people do not wish to be helped, leave them alone. This should be the first principle of aid. And it was, was <laughs> such a shocking um, uh, you know, expression because since when we ask them, <laughs> we arrive because we think- assume you need, they, you, you, We assume they need our help when they were just fine before yeah, they came yeah. along. In some we cases, are, you know. Yeah, we assume they need our help, but the, the unsaid part of this is we assume that we are better than them, superior to them. We it's assume insult, that we have insulting. a better civilization, better God, <laughs> better technology. 
So uh, we assume that when we arrive, we will be welcome. They will kiss our feet because we bring something. And then of course, uh, instead they're watching us, uh, they uh, see how much money we have. As soon as we run out of the money, they go back to do exactly what they were doing before. So uh, Schumacher said, the people that are not the subject of your uh, munificence, the people are the actors in their own development. And for, for me, it was like, what? The Africans are the actors who can decide what to do with their lives? What a strange concept. I thought that they were, <laughs> so, I, you know, we thought that they were there waiting for some enlightenment. So we are of such arrogance <laughs> that yeah. I call it meta arrogance and arrogance that is beyond arrogance is so pervasive that we don't see what we're doing anymore. <laughs> it is like you go to Africa, you see somebody in the street, you know, a poor person, and you put a few coins in the hands of the person and you think it's fine. Now imagine you are in the street in, uh, in your town and this very well-dressed American puts five pounds in your daughter's hand. Mm, you'd be insulted. So how come? <laughs> how come we get insulted? It's like, it's, it's, a, it's culturally, right? So, you know, it's how we see what we yeah. see growing up. And it's, we see on TV, that, we see on the news, we see in movies. We're, we're almost- Let's not go there because this is a, a hegemonic culture. We believe uh, we are, uh, we uh, white people, Western people, we are the most arrogant. And we believe that somehow uh, the world will fall on its feet as soon as we sh uh, show up. Uh, which is absolutely, uh, this is the meta arrogance. Uh, but I don't want to talk about meta arrogance. I don't want to talk about that. What I want to talk about is the genius of uh, Ernest Schumacher to recognize that people are actors in their own development. And so Ernest Schumacher um, obliged me to completely rethink, okay, so who on earth do you have to become to be invited? If Schumacher said, don't show up uninvited. Sure, sure. What kind of a man, what kind of a woman, what kind of an organization you have to be to be invited? It's easy. You are a, you know, uh, a rich kid. <laughs> you are a, a, a trust uh, uh, a kid from a, a wealthy American family. You set up a foundation and you show in Africa. That's easy. But now imagine you have nothing and you cannot give money to people. Who on earth will ever invite, will ever invite you? So what happened, I, uh, I had these transformative times and I took, you know, uh, I did lots of thinking and reading and I went to do a PhD, a doctorate of research on the possibility of doing economic development and social development in response, only responding. So your work. So you spent a lot of your career working with organizations, right? I've been working with government, perspective. Non -per -profit government. And mm -hmm. government, non per profit, and corporation. I've been working with the largest mining companies in the world. I've been working with some of the biggest utility companies in the world. Uh, uh, I've been working with anyone who is saying, what can I do to revitalize my community? What can I do for the community not to hate me anymore? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We really would like to be seen as partners in development. And yet everything we do, as soon as we arrive in a community, if we give money to somebody, then everybody wants money. <laughs> if we, if we uh, uh, fund an association to do good work, and we fund it for five years, 10 years, until, until we fund it, they love us. The moment we stop the funding, they become our worst enemy. So, so we do not know any longer what to do with communities. What we have developed is a methodology called enterprise facilitation, where uh, if invited in a community, we train a local person. How do you get invited? To, 
how do you get invited? Let's start there. How, how do you get invited? What does that look like? How do you, you know, reach uh, out or? Well, well uh, what happened is that um, uh, this was the very, very uh, the first, the very problem that I had was when I started to write my uh, PhD and I uh, transferred from a, an African university to uh, an Australian university, I started my PhD in South Africa and in South Africa, they would not allow me to work with the black communities because it was still time, apartheid time. So I moved to Australia, an Australian university gave me a scholarship and I said to my professor, uh, how can I demonstrate this? And, and I said, I do not want to arrive anybody in a community. And the professor said, look, you're part of, of this university. The first time a community comes to a, a university uh, seeking help, uh, we will tell uh, the community that uh, we have this crazy Italian <laughs> researcher who has an idea instead of helping you with a strategic development plan because you know, cities, cities constantly do this uh, 20 years plan, okay? Mm -hmm. So the planners are constantly consulting with cities. And the next time uh, our economic uh, department gets invited to do a strategic plan, we, we will tell the people that there is this Italian guy who believes that you have everything you need already in your community. You have passionate people, intelligence, resource, why don't you listen to the local people and help local people transform their own ideas into uh, enterprises, social enterprises, uh, you know, anything from, from theater companies. <laughs> to... start, Ernesto. So if I, I'm, I'm a CHRO, I want a lot of the CHROs that I work with are now responsible for CSR in yeah. their business. Yeah, those how, were the people. <laughs> how do you begin though? What's the first steps? You know, what, 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 what are some, give some, some practice. The, the first advice. step is to be, to go with the, uh, the manager of uh, CSR um, to uh, public meetings in the community. And they're terrified because they, at least they hate us. <laughs> and I said, let's go <laughs> and tell them that from now on, you're going to listen to them, to the daughter, to the husband, to the spouses, and help them transform their own ideas into businesses. That you will never give them money because money is, is uh, the most dangerous thing to use in communities development because divides the community, corrupts. And for every person you give money, there are 10 hating you because you have not given the money to them. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, what we do, even with money companies in communities where they've been sued by the community, if we arrive and we have a public meeting, and there are all these people like this who say, What you want? And you're then the I, en you're I, the enemy. You're, en you're the enemy coming in, Anesta. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I, we go there and we say to the, the community, we say, We think the money company has been wrong here. I think what the money company should be doing is helping you transform your own ideas and. Uh, you should help you with your own concepts and ideas. And, and then we said, if you think that the money company should do that, raise your hand. So we have all these people raising their hands and we have community invitation. They say, okay, among the people in this town hall who's raised their hand, how many are prepared to volunteer and work with us, you know, uh, 90 minutes a month to create a, a small team of volunteers then we are going to employ one person who becomes an enterprise facilitator. And this enterprise facilitator for free and in confidence will listen to anybody who has an idea. And then, and this is why I'm talking to you today, <laughs> so we're already at the point. And then the methodology is this. When the person comes and say, I have this, this you know, great idea, the enterprise facilitator listened very, very carefully. And then after 20 minutes listening to the story, uh, said, may I, may I do a drawing for you? And the drawing is a smiling, smiley face at the top. Smile, we call it smiley, you know, <laughs> a smiley face. And underneath the smiley face, we draw three boxes. One box is, is P for product. One box is M for marketing. One box is F for financial management. And we said to the person, what you will be doing in the business? You will take care of the product, the marketing or finance. And Mary looks <laughs> at the drawing and says, what do you mean? Like, I will have to do everything. 
And, and we said nobody has ever started a business alone, not Steve Jobs, not, not, not Bill Gates. Nobody has ever started a business alone. There is no historical evidence of a single company set up by one person. If the geniuses cannot do it alone, who the hell you think you are? You can only do beautifully what you love to do. So tell me, if you could do what you love, which of these three things you would do? Product, marketing, or finance? She says, well, uh, my love is the product. I would be producing like crazy because I'm an artist, because I produce wonderful chicken, because whatever it is. So then whatever the, the client self-assess and say, I would be take care of this, we say, okay, it's your company. Who is doing the other two stuff? Who is doing the other two roles? And the person says, I don't have the money to employ anybody. And we said, whoever talked about money, you know, Bill Gates did not pay. You don't need money to make a friend. So who do you know in the community who uh, loves you, respects you, has skills which are very different from yours? Maybe it's a woman who wants to re-enter the labor force. Maybe it's somebody who's a retired accountant. Do you know somebody in your circle of family and friends who can help you? If not, come back to me. And when they come back to me, you remember I asked for a group of volunteers, 20, 25, 30 volunteers from the town hall meeting. Now I have these people who say, yes, I will volunteer to come and uh, to, uh, to help you. So every month we said, who do we know who right now <laughs> uh, would be prepared to help this girl start her, um, you know, a flower a shop or this group, this cooperative of 50 farmers wanting to uh, process their uh, meat, their hogs. Who do we know who can help this group of um, indigenous women producing turmeric? And we have done now this in 400 communities you worldwide. Put money in at some point, no? At some point, do you do Never, it? ever, 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 ever money. We do wow, not. So even, if, have... even if somebody gives us the money to give to the client, what let's say a corporation says okay ernesto we also have money for a revolving fund yeah. what we say they said okay then we create uh, two doors one door is pure technical support which is enterprise facilitation and we said if you come through this door we will teach you how to go and get the money and you and but you and the money will yeah. go the other door the yeah. money <laughs> So that the enterprise facilitator is always on your side, helps you to form the team. The team writes the, uh, the bankable business plan. We send the team with the plan next door. The people, the bankers next door reject the proposal. We want the client to come back to the facilitator and uh, we want to say, oh, don't worry about it. We are going to. You remove them from the money. Like you, you remove the- Absolutely. It, that's- uh, uh, giving money to people in the community is the kiss of death mm. of corporate social you responsibility. See companies, large, like multinational companies, you know, outside of, you know, just, you know, mining oil and gas, et cetera. Do you still see them doing this? Oh my God. Everybody thinks that, oh, they, they feeding the chickens. They arrived to throw a little bit of coins around thinking that that would be the end of it. Instead, that's the beginning of a tragedy. You, you mentioned to me when we first spoke about Amazon in Brooklyn. Oh, uh, look, it is the infinite arrogance to, uh, of corporation to say, you know, uh, we, we need to find a new headquarter. We go to Brooklyn and we create the Amazon new headquarters. And so what they did, they would arrive by helicopter and go and have a meeting with the local politicians. Uh, never, ever, ever, ever really <laughs> walk in the streets con looking at even having a, a town hall meeting to say, who would like to work with us? <laughs> How many of you are unemployed? Uh, these are the four. Never, never a single community meeting. So what the community did, they barricaded the, uh, the site and they said that uh, you are not going to build here. And Amazon did not build in Brooklyn. Did they in not Brooklyn? come back? No, they did not come back because wow. they said too much opposition. So yeah. basically, uh, and now it's happening with Google in Silicon Valley, they are building a $7 billion headquarters. And the $7 billion headquarters is, is like a, a gated community because they wor the workers are not allowed to leave the premises during the day. So there will be not one sandwich bought in the local community. The workers will be bused from San Francisco to San Jose. 
they come inside and then there will be a, a Google uh, uh, Plaza with the restaurants inside. It's all controlled by Google. There will be zero connection with the community and the community will be gentr gentrified. So people now commute two hours. The workers, the cleaners, the people in the community, they, they have to commute two hours in traffic, in the Bay Area traffic. Uh, so they spend another, uh, you know, between three and four hours every day in the car on top of the eight hours, basically on minimum wages. You can imagine what kind of reaction the community, already the community is mobilizing and there are already all sorts of corporate schemes and plans to do something uh, to alleviate the problem. Again, but, the, but again, is the infinite arrogance to say these are the subjects of our uh, of our largesse. So we are going to donate a billion dollars for a, a park, or we are going to to build some some houses. Assume so it's always about yeah. you know they are not the actors. Yes, they're not actors. They are they are subjects. Basically, the question to HR was this. We have established some 400, in 400 communities, 400 responsive enterprise facilitation programs that over the last 35 years have uh, uh, generated some 55,000 new businesses. So we are specialists in startups. And the startup is, you start with one person with a dream, and then you explain to this person that uh, he or she cannot do it sell it and look after the money. There are three different personalities and the personality of the maker who becomes, is genius in producing something new, but has the fault of becoming attached to the baby to the point that they can never expose the baby to the public because they cannot take the criticism. They love the baby so much that if somebody does not like the baby, it is like a step in a gut. It's like a mother being told that the baby is ugly. We call them the product people and the product people are the worst people at uh, marketing the baby. At, they want to always the it. baby yeah. because the baby, because they're too jealous. Oh my God, oh my God, look how beautiful this baby is, but I can't show you really because I'm scared that you will criticize it. Mm -hmm. Then there's a marketing personality. The marketing personality is not concerned about what the product person wants to, to put to sell. The, the true marketing personality is concerned about how can we add value to people's lives. It's all about them. It's all about the people out there. So the, the splendid marketing person is somebody who's constantly in the market and gets market signals. She can say, look, we have this. Do you think that this could solve your problem now? But she only says it after listening to the problem. The real marketing person uh, actually encourage people to tell them something that she doesn't know, how, she cannot sell. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have it. But when people start to tell her what they need, she comes back to, to the corporation to say, guys, they would like to have it delivered at home. And Walmart says, oh, no, 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 no. We have 1.2 million people employing shops. You crazy? We don't want to deliver it at home. And she says, but they ask. And Walmart said, go away. And 10 years later, Amazon is eating their breakfast. So the marketing person is the one who captures the market signal. And the finance person, the finance person doesn't give a damn about the fact that you want to sell them a toy set and you create the best <laughs> uh, toy train in the world. The, the finance person is not interested that you're the best in the world at making ceramic pots. <laughs> the finance person says, listen, a business that does not make money is called a hobby. Do you want to have a hobby? Don't call me. If you want to make money, I have to tell you that right now you're selling your beautiful ceramic pot, pots for, for less than what it costs you to make. And you think you are a genius because everybody's buying your, your ceramic? No, you are subsidizing the customer. They are buying your ceramic not because you are good, but because your ceramic is cheap. So what happened is that you have three different personality at work. The problem that we have 
is that in 35 years, we still have a problem getting HR to identify the product people, the marketing people, and the finance people. And the resume doesn't count because people may have studied finance, but actually the, the character makes them fantastic uh, marketers. And they are only doing accounting because they study accountancy. But I was with the director of the accountancy firm to say, Ernesto, <laughs> my, I'm the rainmaker. I, I speak to the customers, I close the contract you will not see me dead in a cubicle doing accounts. So what I'm thinking is how many wrong people do you have in corporations doing poorly what they hate doing, even though they've studied the techniques to do it. So uh, I studied humanistic psychology and I have adopted uh, Rogerian counseling techniques to my enterprise facilitators and to my clients. <clears throat> and uh, what we have been doing for the last 35 years is this kind of very simple questionnaire to say, who are you? Uh, Self-identify yourself as a P, as an M, and as an F. And we have had people complete transformative conversation. We have people, grown up men bursting into tears to say, are you telling me that I've gone bankrupt three times in my life because as an entrepreneur, I was doing the accounts and uh, looking after the finances of my organization. And I thought that my failure was because I was not good at maths. And you telling me that I should have never taken care of that uh, area of the business. And I should have concentrated in doing beautifully what I love. I wasted my life renouncing, becoming the best at making the product. I diluted my passion and expertise trying to do the marketing as well and the finance as well, instead of becoming this absolute laser beam. And I said, yes, you should have uh, people who succeed only do beautifully what they love, but they surround themselves with people who can do beautifully what they cannot do, what they themselves cannot do. You would do. say that mistake so, myself. <laughs> myself, when, when we started the company, um, I did a lot of the finance and operations job and I was miserable and I didn't enjoy it but now we and not good and you become an amateur yeah we this realized that my co-founder Shane that was where his skills and he enjoyed that part and now we're kind of two ends absolutely. of the spectrum. I focus on absolutely and I love just every day doing the show and content product development uh, and, and anything to do with uh, you are the product person, he yeah. is the finance person, and I still need to understand who is your marketing person, because maybe it's uh, part of the team. Uh, my other team members, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you see, the question, the problem that we have now is that we teach this to entrepreneurs, and then when entrepreneurs put ads in the paper to look for a marketer or for a product person, uh, then the HR people do not know how to uh, vet those people. So people come with a degree, and they say, because they have studied something, they have the personality that goes with it. It's not true. I don't they have a degree, by the way. Study something. I never studied anything. I never went to school. So just okay. so you know. <laughs> but that, okay, but that is, uh, it's easier because for you, because you don't come with a piece of paper, I would be more open-minded and say, what do you love to do? What is your, what is your super, super power? But people come with this degree they're really paralyzing because they say, I am a, market, I, a marketing major and the guy has zero empathy for people. How on earth are you going to market what? You are so close to uh, people's emotions and you are so close to inputs that you are going to do push marketing, which is not done. Any, nobody should be doing push marketing. You have absolutely no... Uh, capacity to really listen to what people are telling you because you have zero patience and zero empathy. I believe that we do not have a humanistic HR and I believe that the HR that we have is still comportamentalist, is behavioristic HR, which is based on positive and negative reinforcement. And I think that because uh, um, behaviorism is uh, on the way out, uh, because it's impossible. Finally, we understand that it's impossible to motivate a human being. 
if it was possible to motivate a person, we would be able to motivate our teenager kids. <laughs> we now know that it's not, it's, 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 you can motivate a dog, you can motivate a rat, but humans are far too smart to be motivated. So what happens now is that we have a complete crisis and the best way to describe it is this. One of those famous American HR companies that employ thousands of people doing corporate HR work as subcontractors, a company that employs maybe 2,000 people here. Uh, I met the uh, CEO and he said to me that he was so sick and tired of the, the large corporation. He discovered a Silicon Valley startup, an HR startup with only 60 employees, it was the startup with phenomenal, phenomenal new uh, digital technology. So what he did, he left go of the big corporation and he became the CEO of the 60 people startup. He, he lasted six months and he said to me, I could not understand those millennials. It was hell. Everything I knew how to treat people and how to work with people was out of the window. It was impossible for me to relate. So I believe that some of the HR has really has gone down to the point that now they should be belonging to the finance department. They're doing the transactional stuff. And so that's why they subcontracted outside of the corporation. I'm talking about the, uh, the people understanding. I'm talking about uh, really, you know, advice to senior executive. I'm talking about the very high level strategic thought about who do we have or who do we don't have in the organization uh, that can work next to a line manager to truly understand who are the people in the teams. I believe the line managers uh, are in charge of each other. And if the line managers say, I don't want to understand, I don't want to uh, involve myself with the lives so of the people working with me, they are not line managers. They are, you know, medieval slave uh, controllers. Uh, no, if you're a line manager, uh, managing the line means you have to understand who do you have in your, on your, uh, on your uh, team, and you have to understand, you know, uh, how to empower every single person working uh, with you. Otherwise, you're not a line manager. Otherwise, you are a foreman. Uh, I, you know. I, I agree with you, Ernesto, but I do think that HR has come a long way. And most, I would say, the vast majority of the, CH, the HR leaders I speak to are the ones driving this change mm -hmm. in their organizations. And, and, and then obviously working with their line managers to understand that, this is not a HR issue. This is an everyone issue. And exactly, exactly, exactly. So I think that at very, very, very high level, we should have somebody that start to take uh, a growth, uh, growth psychology methodologies, which is humanistic psychology methodology, which says people only do beautifully what they love to do if they are not allowed to even remember the person that they are. I meet some people who said to me, Ernesto, I have no passion. And I said, of course you have no passion. Every time as a kid, you said, I would like to, you've been told, oh, shut up, don't be stupid. It's easy. It's impossible to give passion, but it's very easy to destroy passion. So my point is, instead of going, you know, imagine now you have 30 years old, they come into uh, corporations and they say, okay, I have, I, I have, cling on this piece of paper to say, I have this qualification to do this, uh, but nobody has really asked them, what is that you absolutely love to do? Is there a way where we can make you to come to work every day thinking that you are absolutely participating in creating the environment where um, you can shine because you shining makes us shine. So I think that it's time to, uh, to look at very much a humanistic HR. And uh, this is when I, when you, <laughs> you, you got in touch, 
was fascinating for me because we've been scratching our heads to say, where are the HR people helping <laughs> us to do this? Well, that's what interesting. And by the way, yeah, I saw your TED, just for everyone listening, I saw Ernesto, your TED talk, which was, uh, was it Shut Up and Listen? Was that the name? Yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, which I did. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I really enjoyed that. And that's kind of why I wanted to have you on the show is one of the unique things is having, uh, you know, diverse thoughts and perspectives and backgrounds. And I think you have quite a unique background that adds a lot of value and, and perspective. And for the, uh, the more brainiac people listening to you, get them to look at Ashby's law of requisite uh, variety. Ashby laws or requisite variety come from cybernetics, uh, cybernetics, but basically says that the diversity in your team has to be higher than the diversity of the problem that you try to solve. In other words, if the problem you try to solve is more complex than your uh, tools, uh, you will not be able to solve it. And in terms of people and personnel, the more, if you have a complex problem, you have to have the, a, a very diverse team to be able to look at it. Mm-hmm. Because then each people will see a, a uh, be able to understand the facets of the problem. Yeah, from a different perspective. And, uh, and right now with uh, this uh, talk about diversity, you know, having, uh, you know, uh, different people, uh, different genders, race, religions in your team, when you arrive then in a new market, like you said, you don't arrive anymore like a conquering army, but you arrive with a team that is as varied as possible to tackle the new environment. Yeah, and and listen, (laughs) as opposed to- Yeah, because if you can't even listen. Before we wrap up, tell everyone where they can learn more about your work. If they want to reach out to you and say hello, where can they reach you? Sirolli.com. So simple, <laughs> www.sirolli.com. one so far. Uh, I've given seven TED Talks. Um, you find me. <laughs> you find me in Google like I did, and uh, you're, you're very, I would definitely highly recommend you checking out um, uh, your, all, all, of your TED, all of your TED Talks are great. I think you've, you've done quite a few now, which uh, it's amazing. Are you on LinkedIn? Uh, yes, LinkedIn, yeah. Facebook, yeah. You're on LinkedIn as well? Perfect. Well, look, thanks so much. I'll make sure I link the website, the TED Talks for everyone listening. I'll link to all of those in the text below. So if you're listening now, click below right now and you can you can reach out to uh, Ernesto and check out everything we're talking about. Uh, apart from that, I really, I really appreciate you taking the time out to, to, to share your that journey. It was, was, was fun. It was yeah. fun. Bye-bye. And we'll, fun. We'll, we'll do part two soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye.